Hey, what's going on? Nick Unsworth here, and I'm a kick ass business coach, and I'm on an absolute mission to help you find your purpose in life, to help you love what you do for work every single day, to help you be the rock star that you are meant to be, to make more money than you ever thought was possible, and to have more time freedom so you can actually enjoy the life that you're living. I'm here to help you set your life on fire. Hey, what's going on, guys? Nick Unsworth here, and welcome to a live Google Hangout uh, for Life on Fire TV. We're super excited because we have a very special guest here today, none other than Suzanne Evans, New York Times best-selling author. Suzanne, I'm just going to share a little bit of the backstory because this is so cool. But uh, Suzanne um, is uh, a business coach, and she is absolutely incredible. Uh, we've worked with Suzanne very closely and we're getting some coaching for an upcoming event that we've got going on and she has been absolutely critical for my business. So uh, just to paint the picture a little bit, I had sold the business, I thought that that was my dream and there I was, moved across the country, got the beachfront place, everything was supposed to be good and I was freaking miserable. I was absolutely miserable and I met Shanda Sumter and I was like, how do you have this amazing lifestyle? She was just glowing with energy, she was super happy, literally had everything that I wanted and she's like, oh, you don't have a business coach? And I was like, no. And uh, she was like, oh my God, Suzanne's the best. And I just lost it. I was like, I don't care what has to happen. I need to meet this woman. And I did. And um, she's, I mean, it was within about 30 days from that we started working together. And not only did Suzanne name Life on Fire as a business, but she totally took me at this stage where I was just, I was almost dead inside. I was financially successful at the, at the time from the business, but I wasn't happy. And so for Suzanne to help take my background story, ask me the question that changed everything, which was, Nick, what pisses you off? And help me clarify my movement and help me clarify what my stance was. That changed everything because that literally, she took the essence of Nick Unsworth and the purpose that I have in life and helped me formulate that into Life on Fire. And Suzanne, I will be forever grateful for that. You're an amazing woman and even better business coach. Put on a heck of an event. And I'm super excited to have you here today. So welcome, welcome. Thank you. That I, I love knowing that you were miserable until you met me. That makes me <laughs> so happy. No, I'm kidding. But I adore you. I love you. You've been a pleasure to work with and given me so many great ideas. So it's just fun that you came into my life and um, then I made you a hostage. So I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, you've been a part um, of our Page Burner Book Club, which has been awesome. I read it in one sitting. Anytime there's a one sitting book, I know that's one that hits home hard. Well, you know. I have to say, that was intentional because I have a small attention span. So when <laughs> publisher came to me and said, I have to write a book that somebody can either drink two beers or one big cup of tea and get through or I'm not writing it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That is awesome. Well, and that was what was so great is it just, it's a book that um, what I love is the title is, is carries so much impact that there were so many different moments where I literally not only thought about that saying, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything, but I could hear it in your voice. <laughs> uh oh, and scary. So there was a couple times where, like, and literally it happened again last night. So I made I made a goal in August, in, in April. I was going to go to this men's prayer thing, right, every single Tuesday, um, for you know, it's at five in the morning, right? And I was traveling, and it was it was every excuse in the book to not go. But I would come back, and I would think of that line, think of you saying that, and then I would get there, and amazing things would happen. Last night, I literally pulled a 100% all-nighter for no other reason. I was just super inspired. I had this crazy just ideas flowing, and I was like, well, if there's ever a time to not go, it's going to be last night because I literally got no sleep, and it was like, you know what? How I do anything is how I do everything. So how did you come up with the name for that book? Is it some that you've heard or give us the backstory on that on the title. Absolutely. I first want just to tell everybody you don't have to do anything. At, you said it's at five in the morning? Yeah. You don't have to do anything at five in the morning to have a life on fire. I just want to make sure you're clear with your people because you're going to like scare the hell out of them if we don't. I know. That I'm scaring myself. <laughs> exactly. Um, the, listen, I was in a day job. I was a secretary um, making $45,000, $50,000 a year and I read it somewhere. I can't remember where I read it and I was wondering why I was broke and why I was pissed off and why I was fat and why I was unhappy and all those things and I read this somewhere and it was like a light bulb moment and I was like, I'm not even sure I fully understand what it means, but I understand enough of what it means that like I have to do something different. And then 
fast forward, um, ended up getting a coach, starting my business in about couple of years after that I was at a seminar and it was a coach I ended up hiring and working with for a year and we even became partners in business and day one of his event he says it from stage and he says oh. a little bit different but it's pretty much the same quote and I went oh my gosh here I go again and so I've always lived by it and when I'm in trouble it's what I think of when I'm trying to make a decision it's what I'm thinking of just like you said when you're going should I do this thing that I committed to or not it's what I think of so it's really been a life principle for me for the last six years it's so powerful and it's and it's it's just so cool that reading I love that by reading one book you can have a whole new way of living life and that's I think what's so powerful about the book and that's why we wanted to have it in you know in the club Hell, yeah. you can just read the book title <laughs> I know. you don't that's even have like, to read the book that's like a sip of beer right there. <laughs> that is awesome. So, um, so tell us about so you know the title of the book and just I'm very curious just about the whole process because I just think of you as just an amazing marketer. You put on crazy amazing events. And you're great at branding and your marketing mind is just so brilliant. And I I think part of the outcome I want for this for this show for everybody is is not just a look behind the scenes of the book but also a deeper look just about you know, why did you decide to go the route with a publisher and like what was some of the behind the scenes of publishing the book because I think that there's just a lot of story in there. So what was the main inspiration just for writing it and was it just a message to get out or were you, you know, a lot of like business branding purposes or? It was a few things. I had written two books before, self-published. One was really a quote book, a thought book, 365 days. The other book was The Hell Yeah Diaries, Uncensored Outburst on the Path to Seven Figures. And um, I really, I hate writing. I despise writing. I hate writing. It's like my Achilles heel. I'm a talker. I'm a speaker. I'm like, you know, can't we just say it? Why do we need to put it, you know, on paper? And so I wasn't really looking for a book deal. And uh, the publishers met me, and they met me through a mutual friend. And we actually invited the publisher to come do a little talk at something that I was doing. And at the end, he goes, "Let's do a book deal." And I said, "Ah." Maybe, you know, and he goes, no, you know, I'll, I'll, you're great, and I'd love for you to write a book. So I said, okay, and we set up a meeting, and I really thought that I would write a marketing book. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly I do mindset, and I talk about mindset, but my stuff is message and marketing and all of those elements. And so for me, I really thought that they would want a marketing book. And when I got into conversations with them, they said, listen, we've been looking for a female business coach who wasn't soft, who was tell it like it is. Wait, wait, you're not a softy as a coach? I can be. <laughs> I actually do have that side to be, but for the most part, yeah. no. Um, yeah. And they said, we've been looking for a person who can tell it like it is and really talk from the mindset standpoint, mm -hmm. right? Not talk from the marketing standpoint, because there's a lot of marketing books out there, and there's yeah. even, um, you know, there's, listen, there's great marketers that are authors that I can't even touch, right? I, I look to them, but when we started looking for a book for women, written by a woman, everything was pretty passion-based, right? Everything mm. was pretty um, soft or, or love -based. A little woo-woo in there? Little woo woo, and I'm listen. I'm woo. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. um, I think that you got to combine woo with real realism and perspiration. And so they wanted me to write a mindset bo book, and I was actually shocked. Um, but I said, all right, I can do this. And when I started thinking about, I took them three titles after that. And when I started thinking mm -hmm. about what sums up what I believe about mindset, this w this saying was one of the biggest things. And they said, that's it, absolutely. Let's put a business subtitle on it and let's do it. So that's how it worked out. Done and done. And so um, did you end up any ghost writer route or like what was the process end to end as far as just getting that thing put together? Every other book I had written had had some level of ghostwriting in it. Um, yep. Actually, my good friend, your friend, Matthew Goldfarb, um, yep. uh, had helped me. And this book, I wrote every piece of it. I have some questions. So I sent it to Matthew after because I don't fancy myself a writer and I didn't want to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> so I wrote the whole book and, you know, he gave me some suggestions. Several people did that for me. Yeah. You know, gave me some suggestions, some tweaks. And he helped formulate those questions at the end of each chapter and we worked on mm -hmm. that together. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, but we did not. But I wrote the whole book, which I'm proud of and saddened by and still feel the scars of. I just hate writing. 
<laughs> so how long did it take? I mean, did did you just like bang it out over like seventeen a, a... years? No, um, you know I had deadlines. When you work with a publisher, yeah. you're basically an employee, and a lot of people mm. don't get that. They're like, I want a book deal. I would do it. You know, it sucks. Listen, I'll have another book deal with them. It'll all be great, or with someone else. And of course, I'll continue to do this, hitting New York Times and all that good stuff. But yeah. It's hard. It's hard, and you're an employee, and they have a deadline, and you meet that deadline, or you don't get paid. Um, yeah. and, and not only do you not get paid, you've signed a contract that you're going to have to pay them damages, right, for oh, not wow. hitting your deadline. Wow. So I had to do it, and you know me, Nick. I mean, I'm going to hit my deadline. You do, do what I'm supposed to do. I mean, is how you do it <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I did it. Um, I first planned to go to a hotel for two days and do the the basic outline, and I did, and I checked into this really nice hotel. That, did you go to the Umstead when you were in the Mastermind? I think you missed that Mastermind, but it's yeah. a gorgeous property. Is it? Is that the one out on the West Coast? No, Raleigh. It's the one in Raleigh. Oh, Raleigh. yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay. beautiful. So I checked in to do the first round and got like the worst bronchitis any human being has ever gotten in their life. Oh, no. So instead of working on it, I just hacked in the hotel room and like ended up calling like a nurse's hotline in the middle of the night because I thought I was going to die. Of course, this is all like my own making, right? Because I do not want to write. I hate writing. So then the next time came up and I did carve out a couple of days. And so for me, if you look in total, it probably took me 10 to 12 days to write the book. I didn't do it all at once because oh, wow. I don't have yeah. any level of attention span. But it probably took me 10 to 12 days to write the book. Mm. And then, of course, you go into edits and all that good stuff. Cool. And and so um, from that, like, tell us about the, the marketing side of things. I thought what was really cool was um, how you set up the product launch. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you had affiliates promoting and I love that you have three different buckets so anyone could participate whether you had a big email list or a little one or so you allowed people to come in at three different levels and could participate right. in and promoting the launch for it and so tell us a little bit about how you structure that launch and and what you liked about it and any positive or negative takeaways that you may have, sure. have had from it. Well I would start by saying remember that book publishers do not sell books book publishers print books. So if you think you want a book deal because you want to sell a lot of your books, they will only take you on if you can prove that you can sell books. So mm -hmm. don't be confused by the fact that getting a publishing deal is going to sell books. Getting a publishing deal might get you a little press, it gives you some foundation, it might give you some cachet, but they print books, they don't sell books. So we knew that we had to sell our own books. So we put mm -hmm. together um, a program where you did our program and you either got uh, 10 copies of the book or you did an advanced level of the program and you got 45 copies of our book to kind of do a book club, you know, almost yeah. like what you're doing here, but, you yeah. know, to have those copies to either give to your clients or to do some kind of book club. And, or you could donate them to Coastal Carolina University, which is our, um, they have a huge business school here, it's our local university, or oh, you could sweet. donate to Lees McRae College, which is my alma mater, or you okay. could donate it for our mission work in Africa to take it to the women in Africa so that are business owners. So um, that's how we structured it so we could um, move books. I did, uh, I did something that I made up the names for, and I called it... Um, individual book sales, mini bulk, and big bulk. So mini bulk is what I just explained to you, that choice mm -hmm. of 10 books or 45. Big bulk was we had two or three large corporations that bought yeah. anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 books, and they gave them to their clients and their customers. And then oh, individual cool. sales were what we did at the very, very end um, just to catch one-offs, and we did that. So we went for JV Partners, and I wanted anyone to participate. You know, there's a lot yeah. of big folks out there that have lists of 100,000, 200,000, and they're sometimes these sh performers. And I know this, and it's the big secret yeah. in internet marketing. And that person with a list of 500 sometimes will move 100 books for you. And the person with a list yeah. of 200,000 will move 10 books for you. So yeah. we put people into categories of big fish, which was a list of over 40,000, kind of, um, that would be our whales to mm -hmm. our, um, you know, our mackerel and tuna, which was people whose list was 7,500 or more, to our guppies, who was, we don't care what's on your list. It's under 7,500. It could be two people. It could be 2,500 people. Sure. And you could win prizes, and you participated at your list level. And we also did something a little different than most people. We did the contest based on 
opt-ins as opposed to conversions. Mm. And that was a personal reason. I never like to do anything that doesn't have more than two or three missions. And we wanted to make the New York Times bestseller. Um, we had a money amount that we wanted to make uh, off of this launch, but we also wanted to add 20,000 people minimum to our list. Cool. And so we based the contest on opt-ins, and I think we ended up adding 32,000 to the list or Sweet. something like that. Huge. Yeah. So overall, you were happy with that that launch style for the books? I, you I hit the really, goal? Yeah, or, and I then was, some. Yeah, I was really happy. We hit all of our goals. We hit our financial goals. We hit, you know, Am I happy with that launch style? Yes, I would do it again. I just hate those kind of launches with a ton of JV partners because yeah. everything becomes so, you, you know me, I'm an in-person person. Yeah. So I do a lot of events and that's always my primary way of doing business because what happens is is that Sally is on your list, Nick, but Sally yeah. actually came to your list through Shanda Sumter. So mm -hmm. Sally has come through Shanda, through Nick, now to me. So you're she's really distilled three times over. So you have to do mm. some really long tail marketing to turn yeah. that person into somebody who didn't just buy your 200 or even a thousand dollar program but I'm always going for the high-end sale and so it's a yeah. long tail to get that person there and when you do heavy online marketing that's your biggest they complain yeah. they don't like that when it the book came when it when it came it was the wrong color and the reason they're your biggest is they are trained to buy small and invest little and so yeah. they are tend to be complainers so listen I could do a whole webinar on, yeah. on why I think internet yeah. marketing is can actually hurt a business as opposed to help it and I say that and yet we use it all the time to grow our business so I yeah. loved the launch we accomplished everything um, it did a lot of good for me and it brought up a lot of stuff that you do when you go heavy online marketing yeah so that's definitely very good you know feedback and um, about the launch it's interesting so some of the bad internet marketing stuff so it sounds like you know the email list the quality things like that um, how was overall, I thought it was really cool how you reached out to other, you know, uh, uh, joint venture partners. It was super cool with the Tiffany's box, with the champagne flutes. And, you know, that just, it's like that's you, you know, making a splash and, and getting in front of people. And it's for everybody, you know, it's, you know, it's all about what's in it for them, you know. And you reached out and you were asking for something, but you did it in such a cool way. And it just got on everyone's radar screens and it was really cool, hit the goals. Um, and so what would you say, what was the, the best part about that launch style? What did you like the most about it? Um, and then what was the one thing that if you could change or do differently? Well, I, we're the richest people that nobody knows. I mean, I intentionally built my business without partners. A mm. lot of, you know, most people build it off of a lot of JV partners, and I intentionally sure. didn't do that a long time ago because I didn't want to really be beholden to anyone, and I wanted what I like to call fresh fans. Right, not fans that come through a lot of other people. So when I did this launch for the first time in my six year history, six and a half million dollar business, I was like, I gotta make a splash. You know, I'm always surprised that people, you know, come to me and go, Oh, such and such introduced me to you and I've never heard of you. Not to be egotistical and yeah. say I can't believe no one's ever heard of me, but you know what I mean. I've just yeah. I've kind of built what I've built organically and sometimes yeah. under the radar. And so I knew I had to get people's attention. So to our big fish, we sent out Tiffany boxes with champagne flutes, and to our middle folks and some of our lower folks, we sent out black boxes that actually had mm -hmm. A little, um, it looked like tequila, but it was really a chocolate, a shot glass. Oh, actually. I got um, one of those bad boys. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Just, <laughs> a shot of I used yeah. it right away. <laughs> exactly. Good. Good job. Good boy. Um, and then it had some little party favors in it. And it all, all of the boxes had our collateral in it that described yeah. about the launch. So we really wanted to get people's attention. And it really worked because we ended up having people like, Evan Pagan, who didn't get a box, he wasn't on my list, but he heard about the boxes and ended yeah. up being a JV partner. So that worked really well. Again, go offline and hit some folks with, I mean, yeah. go, go leave online and go offline and hit some folks with some offline stuff that worked really well for us. And we did it through a postal system that told us when the box had been delivered. Uh, okay. So 24 hours later, we made immediate phone calls to everyone to lock them into a That's JV awesome. position. So that worked swimmingly. My goal was to have 100 partners, and we had 232. Sweet. So yeah, it worked out really great. Um, what do I wish I had done differently when it came to mm -hmm. that or different? Probably, um, you know, 
probably, not probably, starting sooner, I did a very bad thing. This launch happened January 11th, and we started this process in November. The yeah. fact that we pulled this off does not make us smart. It makes us a lucky miracle. And we just got behind. I have a busy company, and we meant to start September-ish. That was our goal. And the fact that so many people said yes in such a short period of time was great, and we really messed ourselves up by four to eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's incredible. I mean, that short a time frame to pull all that off, that's crazy. I think it's it, a... Well, it I want to come. <laughs> I want to come back to team and how you've built your culture at some point just because it's I think it's really amazing how, you, how you've done that. Um, but outside of that, so what would you say as far as for someone if they're considering self self-publishing or going to a publisher? I mean, is there an, there's the like an advance from Wiley? Is that attractive because they're going to do the publishing? You've got to do your marketing either way. Um, right. What would you say the big pros and cons between you know going with a publisher like Wiley if you can pull that off or sure. going on the self-published side? Well, you know, you're probably not going to get published unless you self-publish first yeah. um, for a few reasons. Again, they, they want to prove that you can sell books yeah. and, so, and prove that you have a following. So you probably want to self-publish first. That goes without saying. And, yeah, an advance is attractive. Um, you know, for me, I know how to make money, so I'm not, I wasn't so concerned with the advance. I really just wanted the backing of a publisher if we were going to go to the New York Times route and we were really going to put a lot of PR effort in and all of that yeah. in addition to the marketing and sales. So for me, it worked out well that I had, you know, self-published two books and then mm -hmm. got this opportunity and it, this opportunity combined with hitting the Times and, you know, hitting a Wall Street Journal bestseller and some others. So for us, um, it worked out really well. And I would say if you haven't published anything yet, you need to self-publish first. You need to learn the yeah. process of writing a book. You need to learn the process of selling a book. And the main thing is, is that a self-published book is used for what I like to call a big business card. So mm. it can get you speaking gigs, it can get you partnerships and clients, and so you want a book, and don't worry so much about the publisher until you um, have built a big following and you can mm. back up selling books to a publisher. Wow, that's cool. You know, for some reason, I actually used to think that self-publishing, and if it didn't go great, that it could hurt you, but basically they like to see that experience, grow your following, and, and uh, okay. And then what well, about... Think about, just, just for a second, think about two of the best-selling books in the self-help industry of mm -hmm. all times were self-published books that then a publisher took over. And that's okay. Louis Hayes, Heal, yep. Your, uh, Heal, Heal Your Own Body, and um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Hmm. Yeah, wow, well, I didn't sold. know that about Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's crazy. They were both self-published books. books that were picked up by publishers. Wow, okay. And, um, and so... As far as the New York Times, I mean, is that just as simple as just hitting a certain number of books sold? Or is it like based on what else is on the market and it's the list, like the top ten? Or is it just you hit a certain number in a certain set of time and boom, you're good? Or No, it's exactly what you said. It is a certain number mm -hmm. during a certain time period going up against certain people. So you uh, can okay. pretty much know the number you need to gun for. We were gunning for 11,000 sales. Okay. And we ended up quickly doing 12,000, and since the two or three months past that, we've done about almost 19,000. So we've sold oh, wow. really, really well. But 11,000 was what we were gunning for, but if a book dropped in, uh, three or four unexpected, and you had no idea, you're guaranteed nothing. That's, a, that's just a number to shoot for, right? It's okay. a number to aim for. But, you know, as my friend Larry Winget always says, he goes, you think you're golden in that damn you know, uh, Ava Gardner, uh, the, uh, Ina Gardner, you know, does a cookbook and everybody's screwed. Ah, uh, so. that'd be crazy. And so, so post-book launch, um, what have you found from the, you know, the New York Times bestseller? I mean, have you seen some, like, noticeable brand impact or things, opportunities have come up or new circles to network with or, you know, has that been, like, a very obvious and apparent thing or is it just something that you feel like it's trickling into right now or... I think it's been both. I think there's been some yeah. trickle effect. I mean, we had some of the best sales we've ever had at our last Be the Change event. Sweet. Um, cool. Yeah, and it was just a couple of weeks ago, and it wasn't our biggest event. Last year was our biggest event. We had about a thousand people. This year it was about eight hundred, oh, and wow. um, and it but it it was our best sales, and I think that had a big part to do with the book launch. Okay. Um, but also we've had you know 
we just got an email from a big company asking us to name our price for a keynote. Um, we've been asked to do keynotes. We've had to turn a few down, actually. Unfortunately, I just I kind of have a crazy schedule, but the keynotes have come in from New York yeah. Times bestseller. Definitely the, those book sales that, you know, mm -hmm. we hit our 12,000 or so, but those that have come have come from. Okay. Um, they just did a reprint, and of course the new reprint says New York Times bestseller oh, on it. Um, we were in 32 airports nationwide um, on the bestseller list in the airport. Mm -hmm. So we've had people from all over the world, you know, say, we well, found your book. You know, it's been an amazing yeah. opt-in. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's been an amazing yeah. uh, traffic generator. So we're seeing some fast effects and definitely seeing some trickle effects. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what's so cool about it is that, like you said, it's it's your business card, it's the branding positioning, and that thing is just a lead magnet, you know, with opt-ins filled throughout and, you know, driving fresh, you know, new people and prospects that well, have a whole lot of respect. Read your book, you. right? Yeah. It's not just like, oh yeah, I'll get the free CD, but they've been, they went into yeah. a store and paid 22 bucks or whatever. They've yeah. invested in you already. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Um, so now what I'd love to do is just to dive in a little bit about our four pillars. So just a couple quick, you know, tidbits on marketing, mindset, purpose, and uh, and networking. So um, one of the things that always keep comes up, you know, with our clients is trying to, um, you know, get each person to that point where they're in that alignment where work is simple. It's kind of like I think about the amount of challenge and the amount of strife I had as an entrepreneur and falling, failing forward fast and, you know, and then, you know, meeting you and getting really aligned. Like, I will never forget when you said, Nick, what effing pisses you off? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm pretty, like, happy guy for the most part. And it was, it was my background story, you know. It was, it was the fact that most entrepreneurs, you know, I got sold the bill of goods and network marketing that it was, it was financial freedom and all this amazing lifestyle and then internet marketing was jet setting and beaches on a, with a laptop and none of that stuff was true. Everyone was working like crazy, you know, and then getting all that in alignment with my purpose to help people live their life on fire. So I think about it as, um, you know, what's their background story, what's their stance and strategy, but like if you're going to take someone that they feel like they've got a gift inside them, they've, there's a message a little bit of clarification, but how would you look at drilling down and 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 to figure out what your purpose is or what is that that passion or you know you're you're maybe the person they're working in a job they don't they're not really crazy about it and they want it to to, to do something more but they're not sure which way to go. How do you, would you look at discovering that purpose? I don't think it matters. I don't think that you know, remember the definition of passion is an uncontrollable emotion. You do not want an uncontrollable emotion building a business. So I don't think you worry about passion or purpose. I think you worry, figure out something you're good at. And then you do it long enough that you're really passionate about it. When you think about Steve Jobs and you think mm -hmm. about um, you know, all, of the, all of the greats, right? Richard Branson, none of them took their passion and went after it. Steve Jobs was passionate about yoga. He was living in retreats and passionate about, you know, thinking on a on a higher level and mindset. And you know, Richard Branson had nothing to do with what he did now, but they mm. figured out something they were good at. Now, don't we know later in life all of that stuff that Steve Jobs was studying and loved when he was younger? He mm. brought into the company and the culture of Apple. Sure. Um, but I think that uh, there's a great book out right now. I don't know if you've read it called um, "Be So Good They Can't Ignore You" by Cal mm. Newport. And he Shut has, down, he's, yeah, he's amazing. Cal Newport, be so good they can't ignore you. He is a professor at Georgetown. And okay. he can prove that anybody who fall, starts a business based on passion will fail. Wow. Because it wow. is all emotional as opposed to what works. And, and, and it's a great book and it's just an amazing um an amazing amount of learning in it because we're all obsessed with what can I be passionate about and love every day. Well, I don't want to do that for a living. You want to know what I love every day? Like we just bought a sea dew and we've got mm -hmm. two dogs and I have two kayaks and I have this house that sits on the water and I'm passionate about getting done with this webinar and going home <laughs> and sitting in an Adirondack chair and having a glass of wine and if it's high tide, maybe going out in the boat. That's what I'm passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. I enjoy this and I'm good at it and I've gotten better at it and I love yeah. my work. But if you think you can be as passionate about your work as you can getting laid, as you can like <laughs> loving to go out on a boat, as you get, you're crazy. 
and you should yeah. right do your work so you can be passionate about other things and, mm. and and hopefully really love your work so I really think you find something you're good at and you become so masterful at it you're really passionate about it I was not passionate about marketing in the beginning I didn't know anything about it I was learning I was growing and then I started mm -hmm. to teach it and then the better I got at it the harder I worked at it the more I enjoyed it and the more passionate I got about it um, that great film Yiro Dreams of Sushi which you know we watched in one yeah. of our masterminds mm -hmm. he was not passionate about sushi they just told him that's what you're gonna do as a child mm -hmm. but he worked at it so hard and became a master at it that now he's extraordinarily passionate about it so right. I say find something you're good at because I'll tell you what you'll become really passionate about a ton of money if you <laughs> can make a lot of money it makes I'm, money is not the most important thing in the world but it touches everything that is and so mm. if you can make money to have freedom and choices and live a lifestyle that you want, you'll become passionate about your work. And if you become, you know, fall out of love with your work or something, you'll have the money and the resources to start something else and something new or an offshoot that you become passionate about. A few years ago, I was getting a little stagnant in the business. I wasn't out of love with it. I just thought I need to do something new and I started yeah. Hell Yes Studios. Yeah. So for me, that was a new thing to work on in the business, and I got a lot of my, you know, mojo back because it was a new thing to work on. Now we're in the process, you know, of working on Hell Yeah Culture and Hell Yeah Hiring. We have a whole, um, also Hell Yeah, Hell Yeah Nation, which is a whole line of merchandise, and we've been working oh, really closely with Life Is Good. Okay. Um, company and so it's about the core of what I do is business coaching and marketing consultant but I've got all these offshoots that keep me energized and alive but that hard work in the middle core is what allows me to do the other thing mm. that is super cool that's a really great way to look at it because there's a lot of uh, straight passion you know the passion test and all different things about passion so super cool so find what you're good at and keep doing it and what is it 10,000 hours to you master something and you, know, you study that so very cool um, so how about mindset so you know we've got the mindset of from the book you know how I do anything is how I do everything but what are some things if is there a particular technique or any advice about someone on how they can get the right mindset to go through the hurdles of, as an entrepreneur you know I think about you saying things like this shit is hard that's why it works you know but how did you end up getting the mental toughness to go through to build a business of this size I mean there's lots of challenges lots of moving parts um, but what what would you know whether it's a book or maybe a technique or something you know how did you get your mindset to be this rock solid you know mindset that we see before us right here I only worked on one thing and it was, I was taking the train because I was in a day job when I started my business and I was taking the train from New Jersey to New York City and I wrote it down on a, in a notebook. I used to just use it as brainstorming time and trying to build the business and I wrote it down and it stopped me in my tracks. I don't even know where it came from but I wrote, if you're willing to make a fool of yourself, this is all going to work out, Suzanne. And so I didn't work on trying to overcome fear. I didn't try to work on confidence. I didn't try to work on charisma. I just said, get up every day and be the biggest ass in the room, right? <laughs> be the big, do the risky stuff. Do the crazy stuff. Do the embarrassing stuff. And if you can get to a place where you don't give a damn about what people think about you, but you're doing the next good thing for you and you're saying yes to every opportunity and you know and all of that good stuff it's all gonna work out and what happens when you live your life that way where you don't give a shit what people think about you two things happen one is is that you don't have to worry about fear or confidence or charisma because you just live in that way and the second thing that happens is you separate people into two categories fans and haters and when you have that kind of point of view everything is magic. I actually have a, um, hold on, I actually have this, I printed it off the other day, I love it. It says, don't worry about the haters, they are just angry because the truth you speak contradicts the lie that they live. I don't even know if you can see oh, that, probably not. Yep. Right? Hey, but hey, hey. Right? But that's what happens. I just want to say it again. Don't worry about the haters, they are just angry because the truth you speak contradicts the lie that they live. And so if you could only work on that one thing, getting into a mindset in a place and a clarity around I'm willing to be the ass today it's Tuesday oh it's Wednesday willing to be the ass again oh it's Thursday here comes the ass. and I don't mean <laughs> ass as in being an asshole be mean I mean yeah. 
making a fool of yourself, taking the risks. Oh, you know, should I go speak to this group of people? I don't know. I'm going to do it anyway. Am I ready to sell this product? I don't know, but I'm going to sell it because there's got to be a time to do it, right? No yeah. time like the present. So it's the only thing I worked on, and working on that worked on everything else. Hmm. That's crazy. That's uh, Mama Celeste Unsworth back in the day. Who cares what people think? You know, I used to always hear that. You know, but it, it's um stepping out into into the you know outside the comfort zone, and it's it's so hard for many people to to do that. But it that's such a cool philosophy. It's simple it takes all this mindset stuff and brings it back into one yep. simple and easy point. So, um, and then how about as far as marketing goes? So. What I love about, you know, with working together, um, that day when you named Life on Fire and we did it within a 30-minute window, that was crazy. But, um, you know, Suzanne's always good for, you know, hey, I've got this idea for a product or a webinar, and it was like, boom, headline, you know, uh, tagline, you know, uh, for the business. I mean, just you're always rattling off, you know, marketing techniques. So twofold. One is how did you educate yourself or what, what can we do to educate ourselves to be really on point with marketing? And then I want to hear some tips about what you're finding successful. Um, I would say that what made me so good, because marketing is a lot of copy, right? It's a lot mm -hmm. of attention-grabbing headlines and, and creating experiences. So what served me really well was theater right okay. so theater is always creating experiences and you know this I tell you you know all my clients to go do improv mm -hmm. because improv is always yes and and that's what you need in marketing and in sales the yes and not the no but or the um, or it's always the and and so mm -hmm. that really helped me a lot I as a person who worked in theater and someone who had done improv I always tried to be in the mindset of if I want someone to have an experience right now right like Nick if you and I this hangout is an experience and not mm -hmm. just a hangout or if I'm doing a webinar and it's an experience and that's why you know my events the budget this year is like six hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars because I'm committed to creating experiences you know the Broadway cast of Chicago opened our event this year and Amazing. it's about if I want to take people on a spiritual emotional mathematical and marketing journey I can't get into here, I have to get into here. And so the best marketing advice I can ever give is stop thinking from here and stop thinking about what your people want and start thinking about what your people feel. Mm. That's crazy. And you know what, this reminds me of um, when I flew out for our, our VIP day um, just this past December. And so I had uh, done a presentation at Marie Andros' event. Suzanne watched it you know, the video, if you will, and critiqued it. And um, that was a crazy day. You gave me some really good tough love. And we I sat down and, uh, well, first of all, I thought the VIP day was eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> I changed that real quick. I changed you. Come back. <laughs> yeah, I, so I um, yeah, I did switch around my programs and stuff. They're no longer eight hours. but uh, Nobody but yeah. can take eight hours in. Too much. It, and it was funny because, yeah, they were mush after three, like you said. And, yeah. um but it was crazy because you know we sat down and basically you gave me some really good tough love and and I mean you were just like Nick that was the worst effing presentation you're like the only reason people bought was because four of them were gonna buy anyway two of them thought you were cute I mean you just like laid into me and it was awesome because that's what I need to hear I, I need to be you shocked the system but when you said that it was all about emotions right and and I knew that I mean I've sold stuff but it it just rattled me in a different way to hear it in that way. And what was so crazy, I don't even know if I've, I've told you since then, I completely changed like the next presentation that I did. And that's, it was literally, I think, two days later. And I just threw the presentation out and it went all story, all emotion. And um, and we closed out that, our Firestarter Elite program, the 3000 a month from the oh, freaking awesome. webinar. But it, but so, so tell us about that. So tell us about the difference between, you know, selling with emotions versus, you know, in your head or, or is there ways that you can get there? Is it storytelling or how can, what would be a tip for someone that yeah, they can Yeah, actually, I, that? I swear, I don't usually have resources sitting to the left of me, but <laughs> I have um, Is there I'm like a, a trunk over there? <laughs> I know, it's crazy. Well, I actually, I'm starting a two-day selling from the stage uh, training mm -hmm. that I do tomorrow, so I've just been working on my, um, working on my stuff and there's a great stat in here and just since it's available to me I don't want to uh, mess it up but one of the things that you has been proven over and over and over is that it's emotion then fact so it's not the fact isn't important so 
Um, no decisions are based in logic, right? There are four top emotions, and you may want to write these down, four top emotions. Fear, pain, need, and being left out. That's the only emotions we run off of. Fear, pain, need, and being left out. So people make buying decisions based in emotions, but then they validate their decision based in fact. So great example, 2013 red Corvette. The guy wants it, right? He really wants that car. It's going to make him look thinner. He's going to look younger. He's going to get hot chicks. It's all emotional, right? Fear of getting old, you know, pain of, you know, will I ever have the divorce car? Divorce he dream? just had. Or yeah, the divorce yeah. he just had. Being left out. Like, I don't want to be left behind. So he, he goes, I'm going to buy that Corvette. Well, guess what? He walks in to buy the Corvette. And it's got this huge banner in the store that says it was just rated, rated the safest sports car this year. So he made the decision based in emotion. He hands over the credit card based mm. in validation. So it's emotion than fact. Um, and, and I think that's really key and I think it's really important because it, it is emotion and you lead with emotion, but you always back it up with validation and fact. Awesome. That is a really cool example. So, um, all right. Well, then, how about um, let's go down the the, the path of um, marketing that's working really well for you. So, where are you finding your best opportunities? So, I know you love live events. You're doing online marketing, but where would you say, out of all the different places that people can market, where are you finding the most leverage that someone you know watching right now that could you know take advantage of? Where are you seeing opportunity? It hasn't changed in a hundred years. Speaking. Wow. There is scientific data after scientific data that people trust people they see in person. They trust people that inspire them or move them. And when you're eyeball to eyeball with somebody, you can't, there's nothing better. So I will take speaking and being in front of people every day over every form. Um, and if you took every other form away from me, if you took my database away from me, I could build this business back in a year and I would just do it via speaking. Wow. Um, now secondary to that is what we're doing now, live streams, hangouts, because we now have this cool technology in the world that allows us to get pretty close to being in person, but it's still a barrier. Sure. It, yeah. And the reason it's a barrier is I have my trunk that you set over here, that's distracting me. My team was setting up tables out there, I'm seeing that, and that's always I think the sea dews that are getting warmed up right now are... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. But the cat's in the house, the children are in the house. So there's still yeah. a barrier here that when you're sitting in an audience and you're with a person, nothing beats that. Um, you know, we're doing a lot. Listen, you know, you're the expert on this, but we're doing a lot of ads. You know, we're doing a lot of Facebook ads. We're doing a lot yeah. of Google ads. And they're working well for us. They have a long tail to them, right? Yeah. You know, so yeah. there's more of a long tail marketing strategy there, but we spend tens of thousands of dollars a month on it yeah. and it certainly um, helps uh, helps us with list building and that kind of thing. Sure. Um, I haven't gone the podcast route yet. Um, you know me, I'm always uh, I'm always like mm, I'm not so much on the hot trend. You know, mm -hmm. I let people play it out, but I know some people are getting some great results on yeah. it. Um, I'm a person that I don't believe in. I believe in the 10 10 10 method. That's 10 minutes, 10 months, and 10 years. Um, I want to see 10 month results, not 10 minute results. Yep. So I don't usually invest my team and my resources and my talents into a strategy until people can show me that it's got 10 months and 10 year results. Yep. Um, because I think you end up wasting a lot of time bouncing to 10 minute things and there's a lot of sure. them out there. But I know sure. a lot of people are getting good results so I'm watching that closely. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know and I still use video. Video is huge for us. We're using it in different ways. You know some of the opt-in pages and things like that the videos need to come off of those these days. Yeah. Um, I know. It's not, it's, I try every angry. time. I know. Me every too. single time. I'm like no well, maybe this one will work. Never. And if you want to see somebody really pissed off, Melanie or my partner, she is so convinced. Every time one of those ugly landing pages comes up with like yeah. the door, just a door with no copy, she goes, I hate it. But it yeah. works and it converts. So we still do a ton of video, but we're not using it on opt-in pages and things like that anymore. We're more using it for storytelling. Okay. You know, and um, as, as some really high, cool, almost documentary style um, storytelling in our launches and our programs and that kind of thing. So that's what I'm okay. saying that's working. Awesome. And then as far as events go, um, let's just say for someone that, that's interested in pursuing that, um, would you say, you know, go out and do the sponsorship route and get on stages or 
go out and fill your own rooms or both? I would say both. Don't mm -hmm. try to go do a three-day event, right? Do, yep. do a half-day event and put, because people get confused. They hear event and they think it's 150 people or my event that's 1,000 people. And it can be 20 people in a room. So I would yep. say do your own small-scale event and absolutely go sponsor, get on other people's stages, do their breakouts. You learn so much. And, you know, I just yeah. finished Be the Change and, you know, a lot of our buddies, um, you know, this, this is what sponsorship can do for people. We just finished Be the Change two little over two weeks ago. Um, Ree Perez has closed like 80000 in in money. Uh, Matthew just texted me and said he's closed like 78000 Red Elephant's mm -hmm. closed like 90000 Gary Henderson closed 120000 This is in two weeks' time. So if you mm -hmm. can kind of hitch your wagon to somebody who can fill a room, like I can fill a room and other people, not just me, that do this yeah. as well, Sponsorships can be cash, cash, cha-ching. Yeah, very cool. And that was one thing that um, you know I had never done uh, events, and we did sponsorships. That was really cool to expand our horizons. And I've got to say that um, the first event that we did, the one day, was it was amazing. Like that was one of the, that was that is one of my moments of starting this business that for the rest of my life I'll never forget. Like I just. I, something happened to me that day, and it just flo like it just was flowing out of me, and it was like, um, light switch on. Yeah, light on yeah, fire. And, and I, light on you know, and we we had people light that on fire. <laughs> like random people came up for the hot seats. I did two of them, and both one of them left her job. She replaced her income in sixty days. And the other guy totally ch changed his business. So it was just I, I feel like it wasn't for us. It was a great revenue maker, and that that first event. Um, which was interesting that we made more money on the smaller event when we had Gary Vaynerchuk we actually made less and I remember you saying it's with a celebrity kind of speaker it might be about them and it was so it's just it was crazy that that was phenomenal for brand positioning which was a good little lift but all said and done we did way you know we made more money on the other one of course well, especially with all the expense and stuff but it was that was a game changer for us and that so that that I, set us up on a different can level I crass for one second yeah <laughs> Oh, for is something going to come out of the trunk? <laughs> no, no, no. I promise. But just for the for the audience watching, you know, when we talk about live events versus online yeah. marketing, or what we're doing here, and online marketing, what we're doing here serves an amazing purpose. Yeah. But it's the difference between watching porn and actually doing it, right? <laughs> it's like porn serves a purpose. It can get you to where you need to go. But everybody's going to trade the real thing every day of the week. And when you are standing in front of those people, that interaction that you have and that connection you have, you can't put it on camera. You can't put it in film. You can't put it in a webinar. And that's the beauty of mixing your business with what we're doing here, with live, with events, with online marketing. Cool. So um, this is a selfish question, but um, okay. what's your take on... Um, on doing a live event with a high upfront. So, and, and I, what I've seen you be super successful with and we've done, it was great, is more uh, easier entry. So it's 97 or free to get in and then you're selling, you know, a $10,000 program at the end or whatever versus, you know, maybe it's a little higher end. You're getting like a couple, it's almost think of like a Gary Vaynerchuk as, a, as someone that's hanging out at like a, 50 person mastermind and people are spending 10 grand to be there and it's unique and it's like you said experiences where you're doing stuff on like boats and just unique think of it as like Mavericks meets Evan Pagan's altitude mm -hmm. um, feedback on that what do you like don't like about it the market is fairly saturated. There's only about three people doing it. You know, Evan just did a mastermind that he charged five thousand dollars for. He did pretty well filling it, but. Yep. I watched that process. It was not easy. You know, yeah. Brendan did it, whatever, two years ago, a year ago. He did the 10000 Um, You don't keep seeing that come around, though, do you? Which is really yeah. interesting. So the yeah. market is fairly saturated. You know, I do one event a year that costs $10,000 a pop. That's the one that starts tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. We limit it, though. We put, you know, 12 to 20 people in it every time. Oh, okay. um, and And we run it twice a year. But... The market, um, it's very hard um, unless your stature, and you know, most people went to Evan or went to Brendan because it was Evan and Brendan. And my gosh, if they're, you know, charging that much, there must be some kind of, you know, magic happening. And I'm, they were great events, I'm sure. I didn't yeah. go to them. But um, I think you just have to be realistic to a saturated market where everybody else can go for 197 or 497 sure. or maybe they even get to bring a friend for a free ticket. And the interesting thing about looking at those 
those events, um, I happen to kind of know what they made from those events, and yeah. you know my event outperforms them. So what's financially? I don't mean necessarily yeah. in their total business, but so why not get more people into the tribe? Right yeah. and do it that way. And yes, there are certain things that I think should have a high price point. Selling from the stage training is my most intimate training. It's what I do the best. It is my secret mm. sauce. And that which comes easiest to you is what you must charge the most for. It took me five years to even do this training because you know mm. you've heard me. It's my yeah. magic stuff. Selling from the yeah. stage. And so when I said I'm going to actually give this away in a you know specific way. You got to pay ten thousand dollars for it for two days, yeah. and so I think I think there's a place for it. But I'm a bigger fan of a low low barrier of entry events. I think yeah, they big, perform better. Bigger tribe, and so um, yeah, I was just just like kind of noodling with the idea of like um, you know something where it's like a Tim Ferriss you know closed group. And you know, but make it all about networking, kind of like Joe Polish's mastermind. You know, like his. Well, that's a mastermind. Days. That's different. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, mastermind, mastermind. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because for a mastermind, yeah. I mean, you know, my mastermind, my Hellraiser's one mastermind now is forty-five thousand to seventy-five thousand. Yeah. So it's you know, and we have twenty-four-ish people in there. So that's a different thing. So if you're talking yeah. about a mastermind, that goes into the fulfillment category versus the event category. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, um, I know we just got a couple minutes left, so I want to sure. just buzz through these real quick. Um, one of the pillars of a life on fire, we always think about it as networking, and that's like we've just gotten so much leverage out of growing our network and hanging with you as one of the benefits was not just getting coached by you, but it was like you opened, you unlocked this new world of contacts, you know, and Re Perez, you know, he branded us and Goldfarb broke copy. Um, I still haven't seen the Life on Fire tattoo on your buttocks yet. <laughs> is that happening or no? I is very clear that when we get the name, it has to be cool enough to be tattooed on our bodies, and I'm getting it. I hope, Suzanne. I'm trying to get still... somebody to tattoo Hell Yeah. We did have a woman this year at um, Be the Change that had all of her nails done in Hell Yeah. It was very cute. So, <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. If I've got to, I got to do my. I'm gonna try to get my butt smaller before I put Life <laughs> on Fire on it. <laughs> so sweet, so sweet. Uh, so, so as far as networking goes, what would you say? I mean, you it. You know, it's been awesome to just see how your events and the contacts and you know, and getting up, obviously the book is going to elevate your brand, but what would you say is one of the takeaways that you could give someone as far as networking and building relationships? You know, it's funny because I'm, I'm really an extrovert and I'm not a great networker. I never have been and I think, I think the bear, and that's networking in the traditional sense. I know we're yeah. talking about it in a lot of different ways, but I just want to yeah. say that to people because they may be on here and they may be an extrovert and like charisma plus and they're like, I hate networking and I get it and for me, yeah. the problem is, is that I can't stand bullshit and you feel like mm. sometimes you have to bullshit to network. So what I what yeah. I did was I really put myself for three years of my life into a um, pedagogical experience. And so I went everywhere to learn and mm -hmm. I would just kind of tend to attract people that were like me or I would connect with people who were like me. So instead of mm -hmm. getting into this world of like I've got to network and build my network. I really yeah. said, I'm going to be like the crazy student for three years, and I'm going to go everywhere. I'm going to say yes to every opportunity. I'm going to meet everybody, but it's all for the purpose of learning. Mm. And for me, for whatever reason, that worked really well. I went to every event in the industry. I met every person, and everywhere something was going on. Here was Suzanne. It was like you know the scary jack in the box. I was always there. But I did it from that pedagogy mm -hmm. place and really yeah. learning. And for me, that worked really well. I met a lot of people. I connected with a lot of people. And it was more honest, too, because I had a purpose. The yeah. why wasn't to meet somebody. The why was to learn, and I might sure. meet somebody in the process. Cool. Yeah, that's huge. I think the events, especially, you know, um, I, I went to one of Evan Pagan's, and that was I, the guy that bought my business, my first big client. I mean, it just putting yourself in the right events has always been key, Absolutely. face to face. Um, so the last thing um, to wrap up is just on lifestyle. So the last pillar is the fully balanced life. So tell us about you know something that you do to kind of stay balanced, and it could be anything from time management tips. It could just be fun things that you do, like the wine on the sea do, or you know, just anything that that you feel that would be a good takeaway for someone that's building their business, they're crazy, they're chaotic, and any tips on just how to keep this thing freaking 
balanced and keep keep you sane as you're building. Well, the first thing is I'll say there's this great quote by Francis Ford Coppola that says, there's nothing attractive about living within your means. And so uh, <laughs> the first thing I always do is I'm a splurger, right? I have nice things. I am expensive. And I'm proud of that. And I work hard to do it. So one of the yeah. things I would say is I see some people working hard, but they don't pay themselves enough. Mm -hmm. And they don't take from the business. And a business is meant for you to take from it and then put that into your life. So that's number one. And secondly, um, I'll just be really honest with you and, and say, you know, um, certainly I'm not a perfect person. And, um, you know, I could be more healthy. I could uh, do more things to create maybe balance in my life. Although over the last couple of years, I've built a great team. So I don't really work nights and weekends anymore unless I'm doing yeah. an event. That was a goal of mine. I said at five years, if I'm still working every night and every weekend, something's wrong and that was a goal of mine and I hit that um, but I actually have a little um, I have a little heart condition called SVT which is supraventricular tachycardia and it's not serious it's not life-threatening it's mm -hmm. it's the like ugly redheaded stepchild on the arrhythmia heart stuff all the cardiologists are like yeah we got real people with real problems here but my heart will go from a normal rhythm to 180 beats a minute like that Whoa. Wow. Just, it will just happen. And you can usually stop it with some things like, I won't bore you with this condition, yeah. but you cough or you do some vagal move, they call them vagal movers, and you stop it. And mm -hmm. um, and you can also use some medication, which I hadn't chosen to do up until now. And there's also a heart ablation where they can go in. And, and again, it's the lowest on the rung of issues, but yeah. it's triggered by four things. Sleep deprivation, stress, alcohol, and caffeine. So I've totally given up mm. caffeine, and um, and I have to sleep. I just yeah. have to. So I may not eat perfectly. I may not exercise as much as I need to. But everybody knows if I stay up, because like you said, you got on a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I might stay up till one or two o'clock in the morning because I'm on a thing. But I'm gonna sleep till nine mm. or ten, and I'm gonna come to the office late. I have to get seven to yeah. nine hours of sleep every night, and it's it's kind of my. It, it's just my holy place, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think yeah. everybody needs their holy place. Is yours exercise every day? Is yeah. your sleep? Is yours the way you eat when you're on the road? And, yeah. and you can't do it all perfect. But I feel like if you choose one, it really helps with your life balance. And I believe um, this is going to be woo-woo, but I yeah. believe that, you know, S SVT is just something you're born with. You can't change it. But I mm -hmm. believe I was born with it because I'm an overachiever. And I work really hard and I push myself. And it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of an alarm, little alarm system yeah. for my body that says stop. And so yeah. I've learned over the last year to do that. And um, yeah, I mean, I was at my event two weeks ago, and I actually Crazy. ended up in the ER. That was nuts. I mean, I didn't. I know, you know, I talked yeah. with Melanie, and I just didn't. <laughs> You know, and then I heard a little bit more of the story from Ree, and it was like, oh my God, I, I, you've got this big, huge production. Yeah. If you guys could only imagine, I've I've never seen events like Suzanne's. I mean, you're talking just it when she says experience, it's ridiculous. You have to check it out and go to one, especially be the change. But I can't even imagine going through and having a year's work of work and then um, you know have that pop but up you know and what happen. It is? That's about building a team. It happened, and I never got, I wasn't worried for one beat. I put, I said, I'm going back. I'm going to sleep for three hours. You're going on. You're going on. Team, you're going to do this. And no one, except the people that I asked to, you know, step in, would have sure. ever known unless I, ch I, I actually chose the last day to share That's it with all. the audience. So build a team. That helps with balance, too. That, all right. So that one last thing on that, because that is a struggle for so many people, so yeah. many clients. This is one of the things, you know, like hiring. We, we go through contractors like we change freaking shoes. Um, and so advice on hiring, you know, and, and getting the, those right team members. Because the way I look at your office, it's unreal. You know, um, I think from the, the amount of output and the culture, and you know everyone getting stuff done and accountability and and they're and you guys are having fun and yet it's very young it's hip and I from what I understand like the pay um, it works for the business you know I think um, you know so so yeah so how the heck did you build all that you know our salaries range from thirty thousand dollars a year to um, three hundred and fifty thousand a year that's yeah. not even including myself and Melanie who are above that and so we have yeah. a wide range of talent in the office mm -hmm. but we I think we've done really well because we've always known that we can train people on skill set but we can't train them on personality 
So a lot of our hiring is personality based and I think we've come to three realizations. The first is if you're in business, you're in the business of hiring. So we, 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 we couldn't do this our first two years. We were way too intense about it, right? Like we were yeah. way too caught up. But we now realize that people will come and go. I am always hiring. Always. There's always an open position here because someone is always leaving. Right? And then we've got our solid constants who stay. But if you're in business, you're in the business of hiring. And the second thing we've learned is, is that you can't keep people. You can keep them motivated while they're here with incentives and um, all kinds of things, but you can't keep people. People are going to come and go. You just want them mm. to be at their highest performance level while they're here. That's number two. Mm. And number three, most businesses are built on clients first, employees, I don't know, second, fourth. Our entire business is built on employees first, clients second. If employees are treated well and they're doing their job, they will take care of the clients and the clients will feel like they're first. Mm. Wow. Very cool. Very cool. Oh, well, that's great tips. And um, All right. So final, final question would be um, what's one thing that most people don't know about you? I, from the age of four till the age of 17, was a professional water skier. What? Still get out there? No, God, no. I am way too fat and out of shape, but no, no. But, I, yeah, but I did. I was both okay. a um, professional skier competition, and um, I was 11th in the nation the last year that I uh, did oh, it. And geez. then I was in two show groups, you know, like old school Cypress yeah, Gardens, yeah. you know, with the ballot. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Well, and a fun fact, just just a, a quick one. Um, I've never stood up in water skis. I went so when I went water skiing, it would drag me by my ass in my skipping on the water. I refused to let go, and I would literally be skipping all the way down. You're and not I did using for, the rocking chair technique. Is that what it is? You have to act like you're sitting in a rocking chair, and you have to give the give of a rocking chair in the exact position of a rocking chair, and it'll pop you right out of the water. That's crazy. I mean, I literally, I, for half a day, I did it. It was, it was gross. It was weird. But uh, that was the hashtag, hashtag water enema. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> not cool. Not cool. All right. Well, no. Suzanne, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time and for an amazing book. And I'm so excited to have you at our event. And, um, I'm excited to be there. It's going to be so much fun. So I'm looking forward to we got a call with Barry and Sage and stuff tomorrow and getting all that wrapped up. Oh, but, good. Um, but yeah, super excited to have you at our event. It's going to be so much fun. Looking forward to getting the coaching on, selling from the stage. And then um, how do people get in touch with you? What's the best way to communicate with you? What's the best you know, opt-in freebie, something going on? But what, where, where should people go to, to, to check you out? Just go to SuzanneEvans.org, O-R-G, SuzanneEvans.org. And if you need me urgently, you can send an email to support at SuzanneEvans.org. But I'd love for you all to check me out, and hopefully a lot of you will be at Nick's event, and I'd love to meet you in person. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much, guys. Thanks for hanging out. And if you have any questions or want to get all the show notes with the – um, with all the quotes and with the links and resources and the books and uh, even the movies. Was it Sushi with Jiro? Uh, Euro Dreams of Sushi. Euro, yeah, awesome movie. So you can always check out lifeonfire.com and you can get all the show notes from today's episode and uh, also connect. We'll have all the information about how to connect with Suzanne. And uh, so you guys have a great rest of your day. And Suzanne, you enjoy that glass of wine on I the will. CU. All <laughs> Take right. care. Thank See you. Bye-bye. Later. I'm here to help you set your life on fire.